Hello. I'm Alice Lieberman, the director of the Toby Center, and I'm privileged to welcome you to the first TGHT talk of 2021. We are here tonight, here in Warsaw, this afternoon, this morning, with our scholars, Shachar Pinsker and Marcy Shore, and our moderator, Ed Sawada. We're delighted to see so many familiar names among the 1,500 registrants. And for those of you who are with us for the first time, we extend a warm welcome, Vitame, Bruchim Habaim. We are joined by members of the Toby Center's Scholars Advisory Council, academic and institutional colleagues, and partners from around the, the world and from Poland. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. The conversation, as is our tradition, will last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by a short Q&A session. If you have a question or a comment, please make sure to write it clearly in the comment section. So, if you have your beverage of choice and are ready to start, then without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Serrata, a longtime friend and colleague. Ed Serrata is the director of Centropa, a Jewish historical institute based in Vienna. Ed was born in Savannah, Georgia, graduated in journalism from the University of Tennessee, and has lived and worked in Central Europe since 1985. He has published four books of photography, covered the war in Bosnia as a freelancer, and has produced four films for ABC's News Nightline. Further comment? Uh, well, um, I, since we're talking about coffee houses, I thought it would be appropriate if I actually dressed as a coffee house waiter is in Vienna. So I'm uh, ready to serve you tonight with uh, two guests. Um, how many in your party? You said uh, 1,500? Well, we are delighted. I have the table Thank for you. you. Thank you. Um, the, um, uh, I'll begin by saying um, uh, I'm uh, living in Vienna. Uh, it's a city that does have its coffee houses. And um, I will begin with just a short story that when I first moved here, I was living in the 8th District, and I was going to where I went to Cafe Floriani Hof, and I needed to meet an historian by the name of Walter Manoshek, who lived in the 4th, and he went to Cafe Spurl. But we wanted to meet somewhere in between, so in the 6th District, we went to Cafe Ritter. And we went there, and I remarked to Walter, I said, the waiter is so rude here, and he said, why would he be friendly? He, he doesn't know us. And so you have coffee house culture in that way. Now, we have two guests, and the way we're going to do it is, uh, is this. I'm going to speak with Shahar Pinsker first. I'll introduce him. And then after that, then uh, we'll have some, uh, he and I will have a bit of a dialogue. Then we'll move to Marcy Shore. Now, um, to say some words about Shahar, he is a professor of Jewish studies and Middle Eastern studies and the Associate Director of the Frankel Center for Jew Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, uh, he's from Israel, studied at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, received his PhD at Berkeley. He's the author of two award-winning books, Literary Passports, The Making of Modernist Hebrew Fiction in Europe, published in 2011, and the book that uh, we fell in love with, uh, which is uh, A Rich Brew, how, how Cafes Created Modern Jewish Culture, 2018. He's also edited other stories, forthcoming stories, currently writing a book on uh, Yiddish and Israeli literature, and is working on several projects at the same time. Shachar lives in Ann Arbor with his wife, uh, the chef and the caterer, Amanda Fisher, and their oldest son just graduated from Indiana University, and their younger son is now finishing high school. So. Shahar, um, I'm going to move right in uh, to the first obvious question is, why did you want to write about coffee houses and what drew you to the subject? Okay, so first of all, thank you. 
uh, add and thanks to the Taube uh, Heritage Tools for, uh, for uh, hosting us. This is a, a, a great opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And as Ed mentioned, I wrote this book, uh, A Rich Brew. Uh, it's, it's actually a long story how uh, I came to write the book. You know, I'm a literary scholar. I'm not supposed to write about uh, coffee houses. I'm supposed to write about serious books about, uh, uh, about, about literature and poetry, right? Um, but really the, 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 the motivation for writing the book and what drew me to it, it's kind of double, you know? One thing, like many of us, I love coffee houses. I love reading and writing and meeting, pe meeting people in, in coffee houses. And I, um, when I was still a student, I walked uh, in, and I also, my wife, both of us walked in at Mol Shilshom, a, a bookstore cafe in Jerusalem. And I wrote my dissertation in coffee houses. So I had, I had a, a strong feeling for, for coffee houses uh, without knowing the role it really played in Jewish culture. Uh, then when I started doing work and, and writing on um, Hebrew and Yiddish modernism, I started noticing that so many stories and novels and poems take place in coffee houses. And I wanted to understand why and put all of this together. Did this writer also love the coffee houses like I did? And one thing led to the other. And I have to say that for, for many historians and literary scholars, we knew about this phenomenon, but it's always like the coffee house was just the background where the real interesting materials were the poetry, the literature itself. And I, 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 I try to see what's gonna happen if we're gonna take the coffee house that is at the background and put it at the center. And I discovered that through this, really the coffee house is very central and it also provides us lens into Jewish politics, Jewish literature, Jewish art, journalism, and so much that is uh, uh, so central in the modern Jewish experience. Well, that's now I, uh, that's all fascinating. And in the book, you take us to Odessa and Warsaw, Vienna, Berlin, New York, and Tel Aviv. And I'm wondering, in all your research and all the hard work that you had to do of sitting there drinking coffee, <laughs> if, if you uh, had a, a quote that you pulled out of one of your books that you'd like to share with us that, uh, that says something about your research. Right. So, uh, you know, to pull one quote is really difficult because, as you said, I, I did research and, and wrote about coffee houses in so many different cities where so many of the luminaries of Jewish literature and culture uh, wrote about this. But I think one of my favorite quotes is from Agnon, the, Lobe, the Nobel laureate uh, Hebrew uh, writer who was born in Buchach and then lived and worked in many European cities and eventually moved to Jaffa and lived in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And in his novel, Tmol Shishom, he writes uh, about uh, a young man who goes to, uh, out of the shtetl, the small shtetl where he comes from, he goes to a coffee house in Lemberg or Levuv, Levov, uh, uh, or Leviv, the city that has many names and many personalities. Uh, and he, he arrives in the city from his shtetl. He goes out of the train station and he goes directly into the coffee house. And this is what he sees for the first time when he enters. Uh, um, he goes and, and he says, um, a big city is not like a small town. In a small town, a person goes out of, of his house and immediately finds his friend in a big city Days and weeks and months may go by until they see one another. And so they set a special place in a coffee house where they drop in at appointed times. Itzhak, the name of the character, had pictured that coffee house as the most exquisite place. And he envied those students who could go there at any time, any hour. Now that he had arrived in Lemberg, he himself went to see them. So he goes from the train station into the coffee house. And this is how he, he describes the atmosphere. 
He sees Stanzi standing in a splendid te temple with gilded chandeliers suspended from the ceiling and lamps shining from every single wall and electric lights turn in on in the daytime and marble tables gleaming and people of stately mien wearing distinguished clothes sitting on plush chairs reading newspapers and above them waiters dressed like dignitaries holding silver pitchers and porcelain cups the smell of coffee and all kind of pastry. I could, I could speak just about this quote for half an hour, but I wanted, you to, I wanted you to read it just to feel and smell and taste a little bit of the feeling of what it's like for somebody comes from the shtetl to the big city and experiencing the coffee house for the first time. It's very, very different for those of us who used to go to something like Starbucks or, you know, just a local place and understanding what was the coffee house for these people. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture that you paint. Um, the, why don't you tell us something about the, the history of the coffee house? Uh, and uh, because I know that here in Vienna, everyone knows that the coffee house came about because when the Polish King Jan Sobieski chased the Ottomans away from the gates of Vienna in 1683. A man by the name of Kolschitsky, who originally came from Lemberg, came out and found these delicious brown beans, came in and started a coffee house in Vienna. Everyone swears by it, and you have ruined that for me. Right. Uh, but, it's, isn't it a beautiful story? <laughs> There's only one, one small problem with it, that it's just not true. I, historically but it is a, it is a great story right so um and 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 a lot about the history of coffee and the history of coffee houses is full of these mythic beautiful stories right uh, but the the actual history of coffee houses is just as fascinating and i didn't i knew nothing about it when i started doing research and then i learned uh, uh, more and 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 it became really interesting in order to understand why Jews became attracted and associated with coffee houses because there's nothing Jewish about the coffee house and the space of coffee house. It's not like a synagogue or a house of study, right? So uh, just briefly, coffee houses, the first coffee houses were in the, in the Middle East, in the Islamic uh, 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 Near East. This is where coffee well, coffee probably was discovered in, 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 in Ethiopia and then moved to Yemen, Yemen. And from Yemen, it spread very quickly all over the Near East. And the first coffee houses were probably in Mecca and Medina and, and, and Cairo. Then very quickly, it, were, it spread through the Ottoman Empire. And in the 17th century, it was brought over, not to Vienna, but to London first, right, uh, by people from the Ottoman Empire. Some of them were Jews. One of the first coffee houses was established in Oxford by a Jew called uh, Jacob, probably Yakub, a Sephardi Jew who brought it over. And once it started in England, it spread very, very quickly uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe. And like I said, there was nothing Jewish about it, actually, Kuczynski and others, it was really a, an oriental uh, institution that then became European institution, right? And, but because there, it always had some kind of otherness, it came from elsewhere, and also because it was a new institution, it wasn't something that is around alcohol, like tavern, or it wasn't a club, uh, and it was at least in theory open to everybody, it attracted many Jews who could not really find themselves with, uh, with non-Jews and with others. Uh, uh, so it's really fascinating, I think, to learn about the history of coffee houses coming from the Middle East throughout Europe and how Jews in the modern period really became part of the story of the coffee house. The You speak, uh, um, I always thought it was Howard Schultz who told us about the third <laughs> Third space. Now I find that's uh, nonsense as well. Um, but you could tell us something about uh, how, first of all, the the the, the coffee house became the the this uh, uh, third space, and then also, um, then I'd like you to speak something about this Silk Road that you speak mm -hmm. about that connects coffee houses and the and the people who who frequented them uh, from one uh, continent to the other. 
Right. So uh, uh, first, first of all, the idea of the of the of the third space. You know, when I uh, when I, when I started collecting all these materials and reading all this literature about the coffee house, I I, I found a problem of how to how to describe what really happened there and what was the function of the of the coffee house. You know, we see we see all kind of uh, metaphors and and ways that people think about coffee houses. Some people already in the English coffee house called it penny university, right? You pay one penny and you get education, right? But it's also a business. It's a place of consumption, right? Uh, it's also a place where um, that people come to be part of a group, but also want to be alone, right? Uh, it's part of the public because, you know, you go out of your house and you're in a public space at the same time it's not like being in the public square it is something that is in the middle between the public and the private between the inside and the outside and also between the objective and subjective because what i find most interesting is not just the places themselves and what they looked like and what kind of coffee was served there but the experiential uh, element, what people experience. And it's amazing once you start reading the materials to see how people can go to the same coffee house and experience it in a completely different way. So the the idea of the of the uh, um, of the third space, uh, uh, it's also connected to the idea of the public sphere that Jürgen Habermas spoke about. The coffee house really um, functions uh, uh, not just as a place to eat and drink and meet people, but as a as a cultural institution and a very important one that goes between uh, uh, different people, different languages, right? And that's connected to the idea of the Silk Road, right? Of course, the Silk Road uh, is an ancient road in a different part of the world, but I'm using uh, uh, the Silk Road as as a metaphor to describe something that I think is really central to understand Jewish modernity and modern Jewish culture. People are migrating. They move from one place to another. They come from small shtetls to big cities. They immigrate from Europe to America or to Palestine, right? And we talk about immigration and very often we talk about immigration. Okay, someone was born in a specific place like you and I, and then we move to another place and that's the end of story. But it's not the end of story. It is a story of a network of interconnected uh, cities and the coffee houses become these points on this silk road of modern Jewish creativity where people are moving from one place to another, like Agnon or Yitzhak Kumer in the novel that I read, they go immediately to the coffee houses and that's where they meet other people but then they move between between the cities and the kind of the ebb and flow, the Silk Road of this network of cafes is really connected with this Jewish migration, Jewish secularization and urbanization, which are really central to understand modern Jewish culture. Uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna, uh, two more short questions for you and then uh, we'll ask Marcy to, to speak as well. And that is, um, one of the things um, in doing research, I mean, you're an academic, and we probably have a lot of academics here uh, um, uh, listening to us. Uh, the two uh, last questions are, where did you find your sources for this, uh, for, uh, which makes it all the more interesting for me? And secondly, what are the, what are the writers? Uh, I know it's, you've, you've, we've all uh, 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 sent in a list of uh, books that we've recommended to people, but what are the writers that you would recommend this evening that take us inside this coffee house culture? So if you tell yeah. us. Okay, so yeah, my sources, I mean, many people told me, like you said, uh, that, well, what sources, if you write a book about coffee houses, the, the research that you do, you just go and visit all these places and you drink coffee and it's all uh, fun. And And I have to say, that was part of what I was doing. I, try, I, I visited all these different cities. I went to the coffee houses that, uh, that still exist, but most of them don't. Vienna is one of the very few cities that still have these historic uh, uh, coffee houses. But otherwise, you, I, I, I walked around Warsaw and Berlin and Odessa and New York 
trying to find any clue that would lead me to where these places were, who were the people who sat there, who wrote about it. And really the, the work that I did was a little bit of like being a cultural detective, you know? I would read a novel like, like, like Agnon or like Isaac Boshevi Zinger or a poem uh, by, uh, by, by, by a Yiddish poet or by uh, Nathan Alterman, a Hebrew poet. And I see that they talk about, they write about a specific coffee house. But which one is it? Sometimes they use fictional names or, you know, they, 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 they give you the experiential uh, uh, element. Um, so then it has to, you have to go into archives, you have to go into letters, you have to go into what was written about this period. And the more you know about the, uh, the atmosphere, the environment, the, the kind of people and the kind of places and who sat there and who went there, then you can make the connection between the, um, between the literature, the books, the newspaper materials, the archival materials, and the lived experience, the real people who, uh, uh, who were there. Um, in terms of writing, you know, there's so many beautiful uh, uh, texts. And, and uh, like I said before, there are so many uh, important, literary, beautiful texts written by uh, uh, by some of the luminaries of the of the twentieth century. Um, you know, since we saw, we spoke about Agnon and we spoke of a little bit about some uh, German Viennese writers, I want to mention uh, uh, Sholem Aleichem, the Yiddish writer. Um, you know, he was a he was a comic genius, and he. Uh, uh, he loved going to coffee houses in Odessa, uh, in Warsaw, in Berlin, all these places that he went. And immediately after visiting these places, he wrote about them in, uh, um, in his monologues, in the letters of uh, Menachem Mendel to Shane Schendel. So that's, that's one uh, writer that I would, uh, I would recommend if you're not familiar to read what he has to say about uh, about coffee houses. Well, Shahar, thank you very much for giving us this tour de horizon of, uh, of, of coffee houses. Uh, and we all encourage everyone uh, uh, to read your book and we're gonna continue, but we're gonna move now to Marcy Shore. Um, and uh, Marcy is only uh, a few districts away from me here in Vienna. Um, and Marcy Shore is an associate professor of history at Yale University. Her research focuses on the intellectual history of Central and Eastern Europe, which means that she's done a lot of time in coffee houses. <laughs> she received her MA from the University of Toronto in 1996, PhD from Stanford in 2001. Uh, I might add also that Marcy spent a lot of time in Central and Eastern Europe before that teaching English in small towns in Western Czech Republic and, and other uh, uh, off, off the beaten path uh, of, of career paths. And um, uh, since 2004, Marcy's been a regular visiting fellow at here in Vienna at the Institut für Wissenschaft und Menschen or the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, she is a, a translator of Polish into English and is the author, first book uh, is Caviar and Ashes, which we're going to talk a, a bit about, uh, A Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, 1918 to 1968, and that won the National Jewish Book Award in 2006. She then wrote, a few years later, A Taste of Ashes, the Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe. And most recently, she's the author of a book in which Marcy was uh, uh, going around Ukraine during the recent revolution and wrote The Ukrainian Night, an intimate history of the revolution. In 2018, Marcy uh, received a Guggenheim for her current project called Phenomenological Encounters, which I had to practice saying, by the way, uh, <laughs> Europe. Um, and uh, Marcy lives with her uh, husband and two uh, children here in Vienna, uh, where she's teaching virtually uh, uh, back at Yale. Um, Marcy, uh, uh, the, uh, your first book um, was, I found, a, an absolute delight. Um, and I can only show it on my Kindle, um, Caviar and Ashes. And what makes it so fascinating is you, you drill down into 
basically a coffee house and a generation. Uh, and we would say this is uh, that period of the lost generation. And these were mostly poets who went to one particular coffee house in, in Warsaw in the 1920s. And for those of you who are not thinking of it in this way, don't forget there was no country called Poland for 123 years. So these were, we meet these people who had just come to, to the um, uh, Cafe uh, Zemianska, and most of them were poets who thought they were changing the world, uh, but it was hardly a time uh, to be changing anything because the world was about to change in ways that nobody could possibly predict. Uh, and Marcy follows this group of poets and others uh, uh, from that time all the way up to, uh, to 1968, and then she follows up in, in her second book. Now, Marcy, do you have a, a quote from any of the, the, the enormous research that you've done uh, on, uh, on this that, that would take us inside your uh, one of your coffee houses or one of your favorite authors? Mm. Well, I can read you the, the opening paragraph of Caviar and Ashes, which includes a long quote about Cafe Zemianska, which is where the whole so chapter is set. Oh, thank you. So in the elegant capital city of Warsaw, the editor Mieczysław Grudzewski would come with his two Datsuns to a cafe called Zemianska. In the summer, the cafe on Mazowiecka Street opened its garden, yet the place of honor remained a table poised on a platform that protruded from the stairway. In these years following the First World War, a small group of poets would gather at Zemianska. There Warsaw was a city of cafes and cabarets, of droshkis pulled by horses through cobblestone streets. Often they fell into depressions, overcome with nihilism, with the premonition that the world would soon end. Even so, just so, these were lively times at Zemianska. The beautiful Olavatova, who was never to become an actress, loved their cafe life. At Jemianska, she said, our friends, people we knew sat around every table, passing from one to the other. The atmosphere was lively, amusing, people were witty. There were some venomous jokes as well. Moments of ridicule like Vajik with the ugly little face, Vajik, Chitkit Vajik. Um, painters, writers, poets. Swanimsky was incomparable in his sharp wit. In passion, discussions would break out constantly everywhere. On rare occasions, the wonderful Vidkatsi would appear. In the summer, Stefan Jeromsky, beautiful, imposing, would sit in the garden at Zemianska. I would mix chocolate into my coffee. It's, it's lovely. And it, it really says what, what drew you uh, to it. Um, well, the, the, uh, the, the first question I ask is, what, what is your favorite cafe now that you've been to uh, so many and you've lived in, in, in Czech Republic and you've researched in Russia, uh, you've been all over Poland uh, and, and now you're in Vienna often? No, I've spent a crazy, like, like Shahar, spent a crazy amount of time in, in coffee shops. And one thing I was thinking as I was reading his book, you know, I, I mean, I, I would have thought it was a wonderful book anyway, in any circumstances. And I found myself wanting to read every novel he wrote about. Um, but I think one of the reasons why it was so poignant to read it at this moment is it's a reminder of what we have lost. You know, we're people who spend all these time in cafes and this is the year without cafes. Now, the coffee houses are closed. Um, and this, th this liminal space that they provided for those of us who feel like liminal people was was precisely this space that you know enabled us to feel at home in different places. You know, I'm I'm actually right down the street now from the apartment where Freud used to live and and perform psychoanalysis, and it is now a Freud museum and a Freud a Freud coffee house. If you know, if it were to be open, which it's not because Vienna is in a lockdown. Um, and one of Freud's famous essays is is called, um, is, is on the unheim, unheimlich, this, this word uncanniness, this feeling of literally not being at home in the world. And what we've lost this year are those places that are, are homey, that are heimish, that like enable us to move around the world and feel at home in different places, which is a lot of what Shahar's book is about. And so when, when I was thinking about preparing for this and thinking about some of my favorite coffee houses in different places, it was a, 
it was a reminder of these places that that you can be not at home but feel somehow at home. And I'll I'll just mention maybe one of them, um, which is the one I, I I really love the most in a very special place, which is very far off the beaten path. Um, it is in fact kind of in the forest on the Polish Lithuanian uh, Polish Lithuanian border, you know, in a place to which no paved road leads um, on the estate that, uh, where there is a pension that used to belong to Czesław Miłosz's mother. And it is now the Borderlands Foundation, Fundacja Pogranicza. And there is a beautiful little cafe there um, called the Kaviarna Piosenka o Porcelania, the, the song about porcelain. Um, and it is a kind of arranged in a cellar with exquisitely kind of artistic interwar staging and scenery, you know, and it's a place where there is not only coffee, in fact, there's only coffee, there's coffee and tea, um, but it's a place where there are, there are small concerts, there are constant discussions, there are public discussions, there are lectures, there are forum, and it's, I mean, I must have given, you know, almost a dozen talks there and these kinds of conversations like we're having now, but in person over the years. And it, it's a magical place. And it's a place that feels very at home, even though one isn't at home. But um, I've seen some of those. And unfortunately, they're all in Polish. So, <laughs> so it's all I can do. The, what I want to return to your, 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 your first study, because Frederick Torberg, the uh, Viennese uh, coffee house wit, who also I learned from Shahar, his name wasn't Dorberg. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yet another thing I learned. Um, but in the introduction to one of his books on Tante Yolish, on, on Ant Ant Yolish, uh, he says, this is a book about melancholy. Uh, it's not a book in which I mourn. Mourn I do privately. Mm. Uh, but melancholy is what I can do here. And your first book, Marty, takes us into the lives of these people who were chased away, exiled, uh, run away. Um, I've, uh, I was so glad that you, you talk about Alexander Watt. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk about some of these people who came to Jamalska uh, and, and then found themselves scattered to the winds and how the, uh, uh, even when they met their ends late in life or not so late in life, uh, that really was a sad coda to how they had started. Yeah, it was an absolutely tragic generation. And you know, one of the, the book opens with this cafe scene, this very lively scene. Um, and you know, Ed, as you mentioned, Poland had disappeared from the map you know, for a century and a quarter. And it only came back on the map in 1918, which is basically when the book opens. And so it was this time when one world and an old order had gone up in flames and there was a new world, but nobody knew what the rules were going to be. And so everything was possible. You know, and these young poets, you know, who were born around 1900, so 1918, 1919, 1920, and they're, they're kids, they're, they're university students, you know, they're coming to this cafe, they've, they're very, very young, you know, and they're sitting around and drinking coffee and sometimes chain smoking, and they actually believe that the world moves on what they say to one another there. It's just, it's astounding. I mean, like that sense of self-absorption is astounding. The extraordinary thing was that to a large extent, it was true. The world, their world was moving on that and Poland was moving on that. There's a famous line by one of the Skamander poets, Jan Lechan, um, written at the time. Um, in fact, I think you may have seen him in one of the photos um, of the Skamander poet sitting at Jemiańska that was shown in the beginning in that little collage clip um, where he writes, and in the spring, let me see spring, not Poland. There was this sense of like the mandate of intellectuals to carry Polishness and an idea of Poland forward when Poland had been erased from the map that was lifted. Now there was extraordinary freedom, but it was also a kind of leap into a void um, because nobody knew what the new rules were going to be. And so you know, Alexander Vaught was one of a very small group of futurists. And he'll later say, really, they were more like Dadaist. The idea was that anything was possible. There were no more rules. 
Um, they were interested in the materiality of language. Words were, were things, they were material things. They were like toys. You could do whatever you wanted with them. Um, and that was an ecstatic freedom, but it was also completely unhinged. You know, it was this, it was nihilism, not in the sense of catastrophism, but in the sense of infinite freedom as infinite nothingness. And at a certain point, it becomes existentially unsustainable and they leap into the arms of the Bolshevik revolution. And they find themselves in prison, first in interwar Polish prison as communist, and then later, you know, accused of, you know, Polish nationalism, Jewish nationalism, bourgeois deviation, and every other possible thing in the Soviet Union. And there's this one scene um, set during the Second World War where Alexander Vat is in this notorious Stalinist prison, Lubyanka, in Moscow, um, and where, you know, his, his, cellmate is being grotesquely tortured, you know, and it's unclear he's ever going to get out. And suddenly his interrogator comes in and the interrogator was interested in trying to infiltrate the Polish leftist psyche. And he was very interested that day in Polish literature. And he especially wanted to hear about uh, Stefan Jeromski who is one of the people that, that Olavatova mentions, the beautiful imposing who would sit in the garden. You know? And so Vought starts offering him you know, his analysis of Jeromsky's famous novel, The Spring to Come. You know, and they start talking as if they're at a cafe. And in his memoirs, you know, which he speaks to Czesław Miłosz, he says, you know, I love to chat about literature. I grew up in the cafes. That's my weakness. And so when I'm in that atmosphere, I'm capable of kibitzing with my worst enemies, people who have done me the greatest harm. Sitting in that imaginary or real literary cafe, I was so disarmed that I immediately felt friendly towards them, a great rush of genuine affection. It's a, a, a fabulous quote. And I'm sure that you would, I think you recommended uh, Watt's uh, uh, memoirs to me. Oh, they're read. extraordinary. They're absolutely extraordinary. And it's it's in a, a, a list. Let me now turn to uh, one question for um, Shahar, um, <laughs> because you also studied. Uh, you also wrote about Warsaw, right? Um, and then what we'll do is then after that we'll open the floor up for for uh, uh, comments and questions uh, for our audience. Um, I hope all fifteen hundred people don't uh, write in. Uh, but uh, Shahar, one thing we if we're talking about Jews in Central Europe culture and, and the dynamism that sprung um, from, uh, from these cities, from Warsaw, Odessa, Berlin, uh, Vienna, and all of these places, we all thought, many of us at, at the time thought that this was um, a, a, a forerunner of what was to come. We didn't know it was an epilogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wrote about the Warsaw Ghetto Mm -hmm. uh, and we would be remiss if we didn't uh, say something about the Holocaust and the destruction of, of, of what happened. But at the same time, how coffee houses actually uh, continued to operate because they just wouldn't say no and they kept them running in the Warsaw Ghetto. Could you say just a few words about that? Right. So, I mean, first of all, the, the, the whole idea that Second World War happened and, you know, there's a kind of tendency for some Jewish historians and literary scholars to kind of think that that was inevitable, that, you know, everything is actually leading to the destruction of Jews in, in Europe. And that's absolutely wrong. You know, I mean, the fact that it happened, you know, we know how terrible it was. And like Marcy's book, following these, uh, 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 you know, the Polish groups, which I also wrote about and learned so much from, um, they didn't know that that was going to happen. And none of the characters in this book who uh, moved to Vienna and to Berlin and to Warsaw, and they were, they were debating constantly, you know? And Marcy said how they thought that the world is revolving around them. That's, I think, common to all the characters in my, in my book as well, you know? And, and, and in a sense, they were right, right? But then they find themselves in these situations and, and they try to make something out of it. So, you know, I mean, in, in Warsaw, the, the book shows how it moves from some very small cafes like Kotick's Cafe on Nalewski Street through the interwar period. And then once the, the, the uh, World War II begins, there's a ghetto and you would think that's it. That's the end of the story of Jewish culture and the end of cafe culture. 
but it actually continued, right? And uh, it, 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 it's difficult to understand how it continued. And I talk about it in the book. You know, some of it was by the sheer will of Jews to continue in any, any uh, uh, situation to produce culture, to write literature, to write poetry, to do music, to do cabaret, right? Sometimes he was in collaboration with uh, the Nazis and it was very controversial, but for a lot of people, there was a way to survive. So I think this is one of the most fascinating uh, 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 features in to see how coffee houses continue to exist even in the ghetto, in the midst of the, the war and, and the Holocaust. And of course, there is what happens after the Holocaust when you have some Holocaust survivors who move to New York or to Tel Aviv or to Jerusalem. And what do they do? <laughs> they try to recreate this world very often in, in coffee houses. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think of course the whole story of modern Jewish culture and cafe culture you cannot talk about it without mentioning what happened in the Holocaust, but it's much more important to see what happened before and what happened after as well. And I'll recommend, because you, you do a beautiful job in, in your conclusion writing about Aaron Appelfeld, right. uh, one of the great literary uh, uh, guides to this part of the world in his, in his fiction and ended his days in, in, in Israel writing some fine novels and going basically like almost like a flashlight looking for looking in a cave for that coffee house culture that he yeah you, you know i was i was fortunate enough to get to know appelfeld and i met him in a coffee house that was the place where he wrote and that's where he met uh, uh, everybody and he wrote some beautiful reflections about chernovich of his childhood and the coffee houses that he still remembered his father and why after the holocaust as a survivor he was walking around in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, and those are the places that literally saved his life because he was he was able to reconnect with this uh, with this world. And it really has some really interesting uh, reflections also about the change of coffee houses from the earlier period and what exists uh, uh, today. So that's another good recommendation. Go and read Appelfeld mm -hmm. if you have right. Any. So let's now open up the floor and, and have some comments. How will we um, uh, do this? Elise, will you field those questions for us? I would be honored to field those questions. Mm. Thank you, Ed. First of all, we see one on the screen. Um, there's so many good questions. We can't get to them all, but let's try. Um, Ashton Pathmore says, asks, this is a question particularly for Sakhar, but I think Marcy, um, it's to both of you. Um, did Jewish women experience, she says, anything in the coffee houses like the men and what was different? So, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about it and I'll try to, 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 to be very brief because uh, it's, 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 I, I've been thinking a lot about this topic, you know. I mean, you saw, those of you who came in and saw the, the photographs, you saw that, you know, the coffee house was open to everybody mostly the people who were there and were the habitués, there were men. Uh, there were very few women. And I asked myself the same question that Ashley is asking, you know, why is that the case? Um, and I think the answer is complicated. And, you know, for some Jews who uh, grew up in traditional Jewish culture, they really experienced the coffee house as a modern substitute to the old house of study. And that used to be a kind of like a yeshiva situation where you have the rabbi, now instead you have the luminary writer and then you have the other people. So they experienced it as a homosocial space. But then when you have women like Elsa Lasker Schiele or Lea Goldberg, whom you might have seen a beautiful picture in there, they are very aware of this masculinity element. And then when they write about the coffee house, they write about it in such an interesting way where it highlights all these issues about gender and what does it mean to be a woman alone in the cafe, uh, in, in poetry and in literature. So it's, it's, a, really, it's a really interesting element to, um, to, to really think about the coffee house experience through the lens of gender. And I've done it a little bit in the book and I, I, I hope other people who will follow and continue to, to write about this topic will continue to, to do that. Marcy, did you want to? I'll, I'll let you go on to the next question because I think Shahar has answered that well. 
So the next question is, has the homo homogenization of coffee houses, for example, Starbucks, um, has it destroyed this individual community style, um, accessibility, independent coffee houses, or brought general benefit to a broader public? Do you want to go first, Marcy? Because I want to read the I want to read the quote from Appelfeld about that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think those of us who yeah, you know, I'm I'm a historian of intellectual history in East Central Europe, mostly in the the 20th century to some extent, in the 19th, and so I think all of the people who work on these times past have a kind of nostalgia about a time when there was less homogenization. You know, each coffee house had its own mood, its own Stimmung, you know, as they say in German, that kind of, that ethereal, you know, intangible atmosphere that, that can't quite be captured. And they were settings the way a play might be a setting where people could be alone or not alone. And they were settings for encounters. You know, the Polish philosopher and theologian, uh, Yusuf, Yusuf Tischner has a whole philosophy of the encounter. Um, the encounter is a drama, and he says the encounter with another person, it's more than an ordinary, you know, coming in contact with another, it's an event. It initiates a drama, the course of which cannot be foreseen. And these old style coffee houses, you know, each one which was unique and had its own atmosphere became the backdrop for these very dramatic sometimes encounters. You know, and as a historian, one of the things I'm always, you know, I'm always, I'm setting scenes for my students when I lecture in these coffee houses. In, 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 18, in, in 1844, you know, Karl Marx meets Frederick Engels at the Café de la Régence in Paris. If they don't meet, if they're not in that café, that day, we don't know whether we get the Communist Manifesto. Right. You know, <laughs> um, Car uh, Derek Sayer has a whole, you know, eight hundred page book called Prague: Capital of the Twentieth Century that begins with an encounter between the Czech surrealist Vyacheslav Nezval and Andrei Brenton, who meet coincidentally in May nineteen thirty three at the Café de la Plante Blanche in Paris. You know, and the. 800 pages that follow tells the whole story of the 20th century through the prism of that one meaning. And the extraordinary thing is he gets it right. You can actually tell the story of the 20th century that way. It all hinges on that encounter. So the, the, the uniqueness of the cafe and the atmosphere is the setting for these encounters does, I mean, it, it does feel very hard to replicate when you can't remember which Starbucks you were in <laughs> in which city because they all look alike. Shahar, you have right. a quote from um, yeah. page 402. Yeah, yeah. So, so Appelfeld wrote about, about the difference between the old cafes and, and what exists now. He said, most cafes nowadays are not so much cafes, but more like large crowded spaces. Don't try to find quiet there or something mysterious or that fruitive connection to those surround, surrounding you. Cafes of this sort are not inviting, they're, nor they are intended for sitting or lingering. You like to get out of them as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's what the Appelfeld thought about contemporary places kind of like mm -hmm. Starbucks. But I agree with Marcy actually, that uh, often there is this kind of nostalgia to something that exists, that existed and is no more there. And, you know, I'm thinking about Karl Kraus who when Cafe Grinsteidel in mm -hmm. Vienna was, was, was destroyed, he said, that's it. That's the end of Viennese literature, right? Mm -hmm. but, it's not. It wasn't the end of Viennese literature because then people moved from, from Café Grinsteidel to Café Central. So, you know, I really end my book with a question for us to all think, you know, is this a world that is really disappeared and is not going to return? Or are we likely to find new places and to create our own Café Grinsteidel or Central or Appelfeld? I think so much is really about this kind of experience. And Especially now, you know, when in the pandemic, I think many of us really crave these kind of places. So I have hope that this is not the end of the story mm -hmm. of coffee houses. We have two, we have many more, but two more questions. Thank you all so far. It could continue. Um, we have a question from David Miola. Coffee houses are famous as being places for liberal bourgeoisie. 
<laughs> locations function with the within the world of Bildung for German Jews with the within the paradigm of emancipation. Right. Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, when I spoke a little bit about, about coffee houses as, as third spaces, you know, there's so many contradictions. It's true that coffee houses are famous as place for liberal bourgeoisie, and that's how they started and the whole idea of the public sphere. At the same time, you know, if you look at the coffee houses that Marcy was writing about and some that I'm writing about, um, it also attracted the Bohemians and it attracted the socialists and the revolutionaries who were fighting against the, the bourgeoisie. So, um, you know, it's, it's true that these coffee houses uh, uh, functioned, especially in the 19th century, as a place of acculturation, right? Of entering into German. A society, but as you move from the 19th century into 20th century, think about just Berlin moving from Heinrich Heine uh, in Café Royal uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, and then Else Lasker Schiller and and the group of anarchists and you know people who were trying to really get away from the bourgeoisie way of life and also trying to get away from what the parents were were working so hard to. To, uh, 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 to achieve, which is acculturation and emancipation. Mm -hmm. And once they reach that, they're looking for something else. So it's, it's true that coffee houses play this role, but then suddenly they have kind of different factions. And that's why I think we, the, the best way to kind of think about them is as third spaces mm -hmm. with, with many different functions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Marcy wants mm -hmm. to add anything. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, the history of both communism, all sorts of different socialisms and Zionism, it's filled with the irony of lots of you know, Zionist, Marxist, um, all possible spectrums sitting in coffee houses and in passionately imagining a time when everyone is going to be riding tractors, you know, and working the land and having liberated themselves from all the bourgeois decadence of the coffee house. So that contrast between the intellectual sitting in the coffee house fantasizing about being muscular and tanned and getting back to the land and driving a tractor runs through, you know, all of these Marxist movements and all of these Zionist movements. Right, and the, and the Zionists. I mean, if you think <laughs> about if you think about her, the beginning of Herzl Alt Neuland, yeah. that's how it begins in a Viennese coffee house with uh, Levenberg who studied law but has nowhere to go. So he goes to the coffee house and, and it's really kind of the dead end for Jews mm -hmm. in Europe pointing to Zionism. But then mm -hmm. what happens when Zionism begins and Tel Aviv? Of course, you have all these coffee houses and the story continues. So I agree with Marcy, it's full of ironies and that's what makes this story so interesting. One last question, um, though we're not at the end of the list. We'll take it back to Warsaw, if we may, as I'm sitting with my team here in Warsaw. And a question is asked by uh, Ori Volner, who runs Coffee who is actually in my neighborhood and has some very interesting questions. Among them is, will coffee houses continue to be a place of meeting, information, or is it more probable that it will become a showroom of boutique? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we spoke a little bit about that. We spoke a little bit about that and there is a, there is a kind of danger that is going to be, like you say, uh, a showroom boutique. You know, I mean, I I I go here in Anabo to this uh, wonderful co uh, uh, coffee house, which is also a bookstore called Literati, and the pe some of the people there are drawn to the place because. They say this is a boutique coffee house. This is not Starbucks, you know. We have excellent coffee that is roasted in a specific place. And I, for one, I love this, you know. But I don't think I would be so drawn to this place if it wasn't also a, a, a bookstore and a place for writers and for events. So, so I think that for those of you who really love coffee houses and some of you are running them, <laughs> Please remember that, you know, I mean, actually in, in my book, many people say they go to these coffee houses and they complain that the coffee is bad. 
That's one of the things that really surprised me, right? Um, I, I like to go to coffee houses where the coffee is really good. So Uri and those of you who are running coffee house, good for you. But then don't forget that the real reason why people love to go to these places rather than buy good coffee and brew it at home with a fancy espresso machine is because, because of the activity, because of these encounters, because of what happens in the, in the coffee houses. And, and the best ones, the ones that really make us yearn for and love these places combine mm -hmm. uh, uh, both. Yeah, I would... I would definitely agree. I'm not so worried. I'm more worried about the time that's got the Americanization. The American is if, if you've noticed, I, I'm less worried about the places like Telimenia on the corner of Krakowska Przedmieszcza that always had a kind of jewelry display um, by local artists as well as coffee before it was taken over by a chain. That was the cafe where everyone from Literatura na Świecie would always go to. That's where I always met my Polish translator. I loved that place. That was very boutique, but was very beautiful. You know, and I loved it. What I worry about is this Americanization where you know nobody has the time to care about the space. You know, the atmosphere no longer matters because everybody is running. I mean, and I'm sure you've all noticed. Um, these are all you're all people who have lived on both sides of the Atlantic. That any time coffee is to go in a paper cup. Every country says that in English. Like they don't even want to corrupt their own language by saying coffee to go in some other language. You know, everything else can be in German or Polish or Czech or whatever, but the coffee that's being given to you in the paper cup so you can run to where you're going is always in English. And that, that's the Americanization. When, when Alexander Vaught was coming, thinking about coming to Berkeley, actually, to your alma mater in the 1960s, Czesław Miłosz was trying to bring him there for a year. And he was writing to him saying, you know, your America is a very difficult place. I don't know if you're going to like it. You know, for instance, you know, people say that they fled from America because there are no coffee houses here. And that's a symbolic formulation of something much deeper. Right. Although in New York, in the Lower East Side and in, in the Greenwich Village, there were some coffee houses. And, but yeah, it is. I, I, I agree with Marcy. This kind of Americanization and the coffee to go, I think that's the danger uh, of, of, of how these places can change completely. And of course, now we are in a situation where if you're lucky to find coffee, it's only coffee to go. But let's hope that there's going to be vaccine and... I, I really think, and, and you know, we're going to be post-COVID world, and I don't know, this is all remains to be seen, but I have a feeling that actually people are going to miss uh, going to these kind of places even more than before, and maybe that's going to save the future of, of coffee houses. Um, maybe I'll just close my, uh, um, so I can say thanks to uh, everyone for taking part in this. Helise for coming up with the idea, uh, for the Taubi Foundation for making this possible. We appreciate it very much. Um, spending some time with two writers who have taken us so much into the intellectual history of, of Europe is uh, Marcy Shore and Shachar Pinsker, and have done so in, 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 in these remarkable books uh, that, that, uh, uh, highlighted through the characters, these interesting people that they've uh, highlighted for us, and recommend to everyone that they order their books, hopefully not from a certain online bookseller, <laughs> the richest man in the world.